We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Greetings, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are in your respective uh, positions. Uh, welcome to this session at uh, the IGF, leveraging the UNDPs, uh, UNGPs for the um, uh, for the for the tech sector. Uh, today we are here. Um, uh, today we are here to um, basically share our experiences. Uh, it's basically in the title. Uh, we are sharing our experiences in leveraging the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights to push for digital rights advocacy for technology users in our respective countries. Um, Catherine, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Right. And um, first, um, let me introduce myself. My name is Mariam Lee, and I am going to be the facilitator for this session today. I work I work as strategic program manager at the IO Foundation, which is a digital rights organization uh, working on data centric digital rights. Uh, we are have very happy here to be uh, at the Internet Governance Forum, and uh, I would like to. Um, take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy Human Rights Day. Uh, this session is going to be uh, held for 90 minutes. Um, we will have uh, presentations by our panel of speakers today, who I will introduce. And uh, as usual, you may raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Uh, use the Q&A function to ask questions and use the chat function to comment or give your feedback. Very much welcome uh, everyone to join in the discussion we have today. And uh, there will be time for discussion at the uh, after the presentations. Um, so now I would, like to, <laughs> I would like to introduce all of you to our panel. Um, um, we are going by order of um, by order of speaking. Um, we have Catherine uh, Catherine Doyle from Global Partners Digital. Uh, we have uh, myself Mariam. I'm based uh, here. We are based here in Malaysia. Um, then we have uh, ADC, um, a civil society organization based in Argentina. Uh, uh, represented by Eduardo. And then we have Paradigm Initiative, uh, a digital rights organization based in Nigeria. Uh, we have Gabriel, Gabriel here representing Paradigm Initiative. And we have Internet Lab, um, who we, we're going to be hearing from Barbara. And then we have Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy, LSAM, based in Indonesia, uh, Ms. Alia. And then we're gonna have um, Kennedy uh, from the Bloggers Association of Kenya. So uh, that's who we are. As for uh, why we're here, um, just a little bit of uh, um, background. We've had this session before at the RightsCon that was held in uh, last June, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we focus a lot more on national action plans, uh, which are actually policy documents which uh, a government articulates priorities and actions that it will take to protect human rights from business related activities. Um, just a little bit of background, as of today, 26 countries have published a national action plan, uh, the earliest being the UK in 2013 and the latest being Japan in 2020. Uh, in Asia, the first to officially adopt a national action plan was Thailand in October 2019. And, the, and there is a specific mention for technology and digital rights protection in uh, most of these, uh, some of these countries' areas of focus. Um, Japan in particular has a particular mention for technology and digital rights, uh, which is a step in the right direction. Um, however, uh, very few of these existing national action plans currently address the specific impacts of human rights by the activities of tech companies um, 
even though as the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that the potential scope uh, of these impacts is uh, pretty substantial. And so we believe that tech companies can play a very positive uh, role in enabling the access of human rights. Uh, for example, enabling remote access to education and health services, but they can also pose a risk. Um, internet shutdowns, blocking access to information, privacy breaches, and also um, bias in AI and things like that. Um, so what we're going to be talking about essentially is about how we connect digital rights advocacy in general to global United Nations framework, specifically this, uh, the United Nations Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights, and also the possible connections to, to the Sustainable Development Goals. Okay. Um, throughout the presentations, we will see two main approaches on uh, leveraging the UNDP. Number one, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, a lot of uh, the um, colleagues here um, focus on advocating with governments for the inclusion of digital rights into the national action plans because these are very important national documents. But also, um, slightly different from our session in RightsCon, uh, today, we are going to share a little bit more on the second uh, main approach, which is advocating with the technology private sector by engaging technologies and technology providers. Um, essentially, um, the national action plan approach is more in line with the first pillar of the United Nations guiding principle. And then uh, the second approach, uh, which is directly engaging with the private sector itself, this, uh, in line with the second pillar of the UNGP, which is um, the corporate responsibility to respect. Um, okay, so without further ado, I would like to invite our very first speaker from ADC. Eduardo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Ariane, for, for the presentation. And thanks everybody for, for being here with, with us. Uh, well, my name is Eduardo Ferreira. I'm project officer at Association for Civil Rights, which is a civil society organization based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, the ADC is working from 1995 in, in, in the defense and promotion of human rights in not, not only in Argentina, but in, in Latin America. And while the organization covers different topics, different uh, rights, um, a great part of our, of our work is focused on digital rights. So, and so for this reason, we, we are starting, we are starting to, to look very carefully to, to, to the international business and human rights framework in, in general. And the United Nations guiding principles in particular constitute a, a cornerstone of our work in, on, on, on business and human rights. So, um, guiding principles are, are a key instrument because it, it can serve to, to, to make private companies uh, comply with, with human rights and, 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 and not only private companies, but, but also state governments to, to, to push them to, to, to look closely at that, at that issue and take measures to, to make companies comply with it. And as you may already know, guiding principles are based on three fundamental pillars, uh, the duty of the state to, to protect human rights, the responsibility of private companies to, to respect human rights, and the obligation from both private companies and public sector to, to, to remedy any damage uh, cost. Um, that's why our work uh, at IDC is aimed at promoting guiding principles in both public and private sector. Um, on this very brief presentation, I would like to focus on pillar one, uh, the state duty to, to protect human rights against abuses. And, and I will use the, the Argentine case and its relationship with national action plans uh, on business and human rights, NAPS. Um, in 2014, the, the, the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, called all member states to, to develop their national action plans. In addition, the, the Organization of American States has encouraged implementation of the United Nations Guiding Principle uh, to other member countries. And the G20 has also expressed its, its support for developing and updating NAPs. No? And, and Argentina is a member state of the three major organizations. No? Um, despite that, Argentina uh, doesn't have any action plan, national action plan so far. Um, but there was a process that uh, it was started in 2017 
um, because um, in, in, in 2017, Argentina implemented for the first time a national human rights plan. And um, within that framework, uh, the country committed to, to present a NAP on peace and human rights during said period. That process started, but unfortunately, it was uh, cut short because the, the then government lost the election. And so a new government uh, took the office. And it's a political it's a feature of our country that there is no continuity between policies uh, through the different governments. No? So every, every time a new government took office, they just start over again. Um, so that process was interrupted. But nowadays, we are starting to see a new initiative uh, of the current government to, to start a new human, um, a national action plan on peace and human rights. And um, this is also a commitment that Argentina uh, has made to the United Nations when, um, when, when my country uh, was submitted their candidacy to the Human Rights Council. Uh, in fact, Argentina will share the United Nations Human Rights Council for the next year. So one other commitment is to have an in, in, in app in, in the country. Now, so la, like a couple of months ago, the, the, the government started this new process called different stakeholders, uh, academia, civil society organizations. Um, and IDC was, uh, was uh, attended the, the, the launching of, of the plan. And, and, and our goal is to try to, to try that the digital perspective be into that plan. I mean, digital rights and private company are not a white topic in Argentina as, as could be in any other topics such as environmental uh, issues, uh, which is usually the main topic when we talk in our country about peace and human rights. No? So, so that's a, a main challenge for us. First, the, the main challenge for us is to try to shed the light on how digital companies uh, can affect human rights in, in the country uh, in different issues like surveillance, but also um, data protection and access to, 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 con to, to internet for, 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 the, for the people who, who live in the country and, and, and so on. Um, we know that the there are several opportunities for us to, to advocate the, the inclusion of digital perspective. I mean, there is a growing concern in Argentina, uh, especially with surveillance, for instance. Um, Argentina has deployed several digital technologies and to, to surveil people, especially facial recognition technologies. Um, but these deployments are made usually without a data protection assessment impact. Uh, without having a, an updated legal framework in the country, for instance. So, I mean, this is an opportunity for us to, to, yeah. to, to raise our concern to the, to the government and, and try to, to put uh, this, this concern in, in the new guide, uh, NAP. No? So, yeah. I mean, there's not much information about, about, about this initiative right now, so, mm -hmm. but we hope to expect more information for the next year. So, I think I'm running out of time. So I will stop here and then we can open the discussion for. Yeah, Eduardo, uh, Malaysia has a similar problem. Actually, at the beginning of the NAP process, we didn't, there, like, there was no mention, like zero mention of digital rights into the plan of the National Action Plan. But um, after two years of advocating with the, with the government, finally, we have some some um, progress so yeah definitely keep at it um but thank you so much <laughs> eduardo um next we will go to paradigm initiative hello gabriel hi Miriam. the floor thank is you here. very much can you hear me please yes yes all right uh, good afternoon everyone from nigeria my name is gabriel Odusi, and i work with paradigm initiative paradigm initiative is a social enterprise and we are focused on improving livelihoods for people in underserved community across Africa. Right, so we do this through our digital inclusion programs and our digital rights activities. So uh, focusing on the topic of consideration here, and I'm gonna build on the foundation laid by Eduardo. So um, also Nigeria is also uh, facing similar problem, but we've moved to another level regarding our engagement with the government. And like he mentioned, he mentioned that it is the duty of the state to protect 
human rights of the public, which is actually the pillar one of the United Nations guiding principles. So following on this, um, between 2012 and 2017, the government uh, tried, no, not tried, they developed the first draft. So this first draft did not have any mention of tech in the first draft, just like Miriam said regarding uh, Malaysia. So same thing happened in Nigeria. So, but we had a space to, um, so we as an organization were following the proceedings of the activities in the preparation for the NAP for the country. So we saw a window in 2018 to engage the government because there was something called public hearing whereby you can give feedback. So through that public hearing, we gave our feedback and it gave us the opportunity to have more access to engage uh, with the government. So so um, in 2019, like I mentioned, we started that. So uh, from there, we're able to work with other uh, um, civil society organizations. So we had this uh, steering committee called the National Business and Human Rights Roundtable Steering Committee. So at that, at that steering committee, we have not just uh, people from the tech uh, society, uh, tech, uh, what do I mean, tech, civil society. We also have people from different sectors within the country. So uh, at that round table, we began to work on the draft, the second draft for the national action plan. And through that, we were able to include the clause. So I can say to you now that uh, as at about three months ago, we received a draft copy of the new, uh, of the new NAP which is actually being presented to the government at the moment. Uh, so when I say the government, I mean the National Human Rights Commission for the country and the vice president is at their, is at their table at the moment. So we are just waiting for them to give consideration to it. And that will become a public um, public, public document for the, for the documents to see. But I just want to use this opportunity to say that uh, it's important that uh, the government uh, begin, begin to take uh, this now as an important document because it's, it gives opportunity to, for, for them to actually moderate, which is actually their function to protect human rights. So it gives them the opportunity to actually moderate effectively what tech communities are doing or what tech industries are doing and how they are relating with human rights within different space in the country. So it, it helps them to monitor, it helps them to also help the people to seek redress where possible. So it gives them the power to engage uh, accurately. So I'm just going to say that um, they should make this process as swift as possible because, as we know, everything is moving towards tech, education, uh, transportation, every aspect of life is moving towards tech. So but again, um, it's just uh, important that they, they mean it to it and it becomes a public document. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Gabrielle. Um, happy to see that um, Nigeria is a, a lot, a lot further ahead <laughs> um, than, than uh, countries like Malaysia. Um, um, thank you so much for sharing your uh, insights on that one. Um, next, we have um, uh, Barbara. Barbara, still from the Internet Lab. The Internet Lab uh, needs no introduction. They are uh, digital rights advocacy based in Brazil. Barbara, are you there? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hi, uh, yeah, the Hi. floor is Go ahead. Thank you, Marianne. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Catherine and Marianne for the organization of the session. I'm really glad to be here speaking at the EDGEF. Um, well, I'm Barbara Simon. I'm head of research for privacy and surveillance at Internet Lab which is a um, research center based in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that promotes academic debate and the production of knowledge in the areas of law and technology. I'm here to talk a little about um, a research that we've been developing since 2016 uh, that's called Who Defends Your Data? And that aims to promote transparency and best practices in terms of privacy and data protection by companies providing internet connections in Brazil. Um, with, this, with this research, we have the intention to create a race to the top, encouraging companies to compete in their privacy and data protection parameters. Um, it's the Brazilian version of Who Has Your Back, promoted by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFN. And during a year, we engage with companies to evaluate their practices regarding uh, privacy and data protection standards. So, we design categories and evaluation parameters capable of measuring uh, companies' public commitment to the 
privacy to their users' privacy. So um, each company is evaluated according uh, to six categories, to six parameters that take into account uh, the requirements of current legislation in Brazil and also international best practices. So we have six categories. The first one uh, is the information on data protection po policy. And we evaluate if the company provides clear and complete information about its data protection practices. Uh, in the second category, we evaluate law enforcement guidelines. Um, if the company undertakes to follow the interpretation of the most protective law on the right to privacy when personal data are requested by law enforcement agents. agents. In the third category, uh, we evaluate if the company challenged administrative or judicial abusive requests for data or the legislation that, that it, cons it considers um, violating users' privacy. In the fourth category, um, we evaluate the public, public positioning of the company in favor of privacy. So if the company uh, position itself in public, public hearings or in newspapers, um, strengthening the culture, the culture of protection of this right in Brazil. In the fifth category, um, we evaluate if the company published transparency reports um, with basic information on data requests by public authorities, and if the company prepare and publish data protection impact assessments. And in the sixth category, we evaluate if the company notify users when it receives data requests. So if the company is doing well, we grant them a star, as you can see in the slide here, um, or at least a part of a star if it is in a good way, in a good path forward. And in our evaluation, we have an engagement phase with these companies. During a year, we collect data based on their contracts, web pages, sustainability reports, and other documents that might be useful for, for us. And then um, we send to them a previous analysis um, so they can make observations, send, a, send us further documents that we might have missed, and maybe have a chance to change their practices before the report is launched. So um, I put these images comparing our first version of Who Defends Your Data to our last version of Who, Had, Who Defends Your Data that was launched these years. And that showed the evolution of the project throughout these years. So in 2016, we didn't have a data protection yet, a data protection law yet in Brazil, and no company achieved a full star in categories that measured, measured access to information, public positioning in favor of privacy, publication of transparency reports or user notification. So it was really the worst year that we had in the research um, since its beginning. It was the first year. Uh, things changed to things changed throughout the, these years. So in 2000, in 2017, we noticed that companies began to publish transparency reports with government requests to access users' data. And in 2020, after the Brazilian data protection law came into force, we had the biggest advance in the category of access to information. So companies began to adopt privacy web pages, detailing its data protection practices, and also punctuated better in categories of users defending the judiciary and public positioning in favor of privacy. This last year, in 2021, we noticed a major advance in the category that evaluates law enforcement guidelines. Um, companies began to publish specific protocols with rules for data transfers for public authorities and law enforcement, law enforcement agents. But there are, however, some practices that still have some resistance to being adopted, especially practices that are not um, mandatory by law and that consists in best practices. So companies still do not notify users in cases of data access, uh, data access requests, which is not mandatory by law in Brazil, and don't publish yet data protection impact assessments, which is also not um, mandatory by law in Brazil. They are really resistant resistant to adopt these, pra these practices in terms of um, best ways to, to defend users' data. So in conclusion, I would just like to, um, uh, to, to say that we think that this project is a good example of how this engagement process with the private sector can bear good results throughout the years. 
um, it's a long way, <laughs> it's a, it's a long-term process, uh, encouraging companies to change their practices. And well, in this case, we only evaluate uh, parameters related to privacy, but I believe this engagement can also be fruitful in other areas that involve respect for human rights and cor corporate responsibility, um, leveraging them the, the UNGP principles. So I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much. And I'll finish thank you, thing. Barbara. Actually, um, I, I should have mentioned earlier that um, Eduardo's presentation and Gabrielle's presentation were uh, examples of the first approach that um, that we mentioned earlier, which is the approach to advocate with the government. And um, uh, Barbara's presentation uh, uh, with Internet Lab is uh, the first of the two uh, of two examples of the second approach of the uh, advocacy with uh, the private sector. So yeah, I should have mentioned that a little bit earlier so that you know um, it's easier for the audience to follow. So we ha we have two examples for the first approach, and now we have uh, we ha we have two we have two examples for the second approach. And Barbara just gave us an excellent presentation on uh, how Internet Lab uh, engages tech companies uh, for um, for uh, advocating uh, the UNGP. Uh, framework in Brazil. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have some questions, um, but uh, let's move to Indonesia first. <laughs> uh, Alia, hi, are you there? Hello? Yes, I'm here. Hello, hi. Yep. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Mariam. Hi, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending where you are now. Thank you for being here today. Really honored to be here as well at the IGF. Uh, my name is Alia Yopira. I'm a researcher at the Institute for Policy Research and Advocacy. We are a human rights organization based in Jakarta, Indonesia. I'll just jump into the presentations because I know that we have a very limited time. So today we'll be uh, sharing a little bit more on ways Elsam has been engaging with tech companies in Indonesia to address digital rights issues as part of our bigger policy advocacy work which also involves governments, relevant ministries, and House of Representatives in Indonesia. So the first point is that um, in Indonesia, data exploitations and privacy violations conducted by fintech companies, uh, particularly peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, companies, is a huge problem here. For those who aren't really familiar with what is peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, or known as Pinjol in Bahasa Indonesia, Pinjaman Online, provides an online loans, uh, usually with a very high interest that are more easily accessible than conventional credit for those without reliable income or assets and women and LGBTQI uh, communities making up a significant portions of their users and um, um, clients. So the process is relatively simple. We need to submit a photo of us holding our, our ID card for their EKYC purposes. We applied for the loan and then the money will be transferred to our bank account and then we need it uh, to pay it back uh, normally with a very high interest, which also a problem here in Indonesia. And because of this uh, conveniency and fast process, most people turn to peer-to-peer lending, even though with the high interest that comes with it, especially in today's situations during the pandemic COVID-19, where people are losing their job because of the layoff or for transgender communities, um, because of the lack of access to formal jobs and businesses are struggling because of the COVID-19 restrictions. And so online, lo uh, online loan uh, applications become a solutions um, to meet their di uh, daily needs. And um, there are even reports that found uh, illegal FinTech applications are building their user bases based on the personal data obtained from the data sold in dark web as a result from the data breach. And this is why it's not surprising that even though we are not using the application directly, we are also uh, suffering from a risk of being uh, a subject uh, or victims of identity theft cases in Indonesia and risking our data being shared by these applications to third party. And, um, this is, I'm, uh, I'm citing a report from the Jakarta Legal Aid, uh, which has been handling cases of uh, peer-to-peer lending uh, application victims in Indonesia. 
that the majority of the victims are women and gender minorities and they face online gender-based violence such as online harassment and outing for uh, the transgender communities. In some instances, debt collectors have attempted to uh, threaten and coerce the victims by leveraging access to legal names, ID pictures, and individual debt status with public humiliation tactics. So uh, me personally, for example, I've been invited to WhatsApp group where a debt collector is sharing my neighbor ID picture who happened to use the online loan. And, and the debt collector is uh, publicly shaming and harassing her in the group. And this is happening because the app normally asks access permissions to phone contacts of their users for credit scoring purposes initially. But then they use it and share it for another purposes beyond um, and uh, outside the user's consent and even harassing uh, their contacts uh, too individually. So um, there is also another instances where the app, which has access to the user's phone gallery, downloaded the personal pictures of the users in the gallery and share it with, uh, with the user's content, uh, con uh, consent, um, I'm sorry, um, in order to further uh, um, humiliate the users because of this is personal pictures of their users. And as a result, some people even lost their job uh, because their bosses are being harassed by the debt collectors. Some cannot cope with the stress of being subjected to public humiliations and even um, this application are driving people to commit suicide even. So, and there are a lot of uh, lived reality, which is very grave. And this uh, problem actually stems from um, the fact that Indonesia, uh, one of the major uh, contributors is that because Indonesia does not have a comprehensive data protection act. So we currently have uh, uh, more or less 48 sector laws that regulates about data protection principles and also several laws in financial sector which from uh, primarily focus on consumer protection rights um, face also various challenges because these laws aren't really um, providing users with easily accessible rights to access, right to remedy when their rights are being violated. And this is actually closely related to the third pillar of the UNGPS that um, is providing uh, access to remedy effective and easily accessible. Because without uh, these comprehensive regulations, people are left with litigations through civil court procedure, for example. And it's also the case in Indonesia where uh, um, uh, the victims of the uh, Pinjol applications have been launched a citizen lawsuit in order to address harms caused by these applications. But again, leaving the honest to users and data subject to be really proactive and introduce evidence before the court without, e uh, without enough technical capabilities is a very taxing work. And this is why uh, the role of, of um, regulations and governments, and this is closely related to the first pillar, which is the state's duty to protect is also a very much important and needed. However, in the meantime, um, ELSAM has been uh, advocating uh, um, about these issues, and given the gravity of the situations, um, there, there is a, a, a public pressure for these fintech companies uh, or the association, because they have a, a, an association called uh, Indonesian Fintech Associations or AFTA, to develop some sort of uh, um, code of uh, conduct to prevent this type of abuses. And um, ALSAM has been assisting the AFTA uh, associations in formulating and developing the code of ethics, especially on the implement, uh, implementing privacy by design and by default, um, putting a limitations on data sharing with third party, uh, and in this case, debt collectors, and other ways to put the data protection principles into practice. And it's just launched uh, uh, several months ago. So I'm, I'm sure um, as the nature of this code of ethics is merely a guidance, uh, sectoral guidance, the implementations will be equally, uh, if not more challenging than developing the code itself. So uh, coming back again uh, to the first pillar, duty to protect, I think uh, government's role is still very much uh, fundamental and important here to establish a coherent and robust 
data protection framework with its uh, monitoring uh, mechanism in place. I think that's all uh, from me, Mariam. Thank you very much again, and looking forward to our discussions today. Over back to you. Thank you so much, Alia. Um, I can see the difference between um, Brazil's approach and Indonesia's approach in regards to engaging the private sector. Brazil uses a corporate governance route, while Indonesia is using um, is tackling the private sector by issue. In this case, with the online, sorry, online debt, online lending. All right, yeah. online lending. Yeah. Very, very interesting. We have so many creative and diverse approaches here. Um, uh, let's go next to the Bloggers Association of Kenya. Thank you, Alia, again. Uh, Wamathai, are you here? Hello? Um, yes, I'm here, but uh, it's Kennedy. Oh, Not Kennedy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Yes, no. Kennedy from uh, the Bilgas Association of Kenya. Um, yeah. yeah, the floor is yours. Yeah, sorry, uh, Miriam. Of course, initially it was for Madai was meant to. I think that's why, but it's okay. Thank you very much, Miriam. Yes. Um. So I'm. I'm just going to my presentation. Uh, draw a lesson to be uh, between the two um approaches that Miriam had mentioned. Um, the uh, the national action advocacy and the tech sector engagement. So I'm just going to um give you more uh, on what we learned uh, through these two um, approaches. So first, uh, Kenya committed to developing a national, a national action plan uh, that reflects uh, the issues of priority uh, to business and human rights in, in the country in, in 2016. Then it took up to 2019 for the country to publish the final uh, national uh, action plan document, which by then now was awaiting the approval by the cabinet and the adoption by parliament. And again, from 2019, it took another two years um, up to this year, April, uh, for the cabinet to approve that document. Um, and then now it's still waiting for the adoption by the parliament. Obviously we have moved, uh, there's a good progress there. But um, my point here is um, when you are doing the advocacy, um, which mostly uh, is time uh, based, uh, the, the first lesson we have learned there is to have a longer term, you know, you have to like look at it in more longer term uh, than just saying, okay, we are going to do the advocacy for two or one year or two years or three years. Uh, because the government bureaucracy um, is, uh, you can't predict it, but obviously things move a bit slow. Um, so I think when you are, you are designing a program, um, a advocacy program, the, the most important thing is to have probably, you know, divide it into more short term, maybe mid term, and then longer term version of it, uh, depending on how things will go um, uh, with that. Then the other thing that we have really come across uh, and realized that work uh, well is the public awareness campaigns. Um, for us, we have used social media uh, and the digital space um, to talk much about the, the NAP, uh, the National Action Plan. And this has moved a needle. Whenever we do this, we see changes um, um, uh, either you know the tech sector side or even the government side we see people committing more to you know either developing the nap or, or moving the process of the nap or the uh, or, or starting to to accept that if you're running a big business within the country you need to um, respect the, uh, the human rights um, in that point and then i'll move to uh, um, to talking about tech sector specific and uh, one of the things that we have learned through the process is that the language matters. Um, uh, in Kenya, for example, when you use the word human rights, most tech uh, SMEs, they feel like it's a confrontational issues. It's like you are having a confrontation with the government. And most of them, some of them, I would say not all, but some of them shy away from uh, that they just want to do their businesses they just want to run their their, their startups and not uh, be in a confrontation with the government and uh, whenever you say business human rights 
um, sometimes it's the human rights part that comes up first and they like this one is left to the uh, civil society and not um, not, uh, not 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 the tech sector. Um, uh, so it's that we had to take um, uh, a lot of you know educating the 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 the, uh, the the tech SMEs and even the some big companies on what this exactly means. Them respecting the the human rights, not uh, issue of advocating for that, but them expecting it, uh, respecting and you know putting into place. Um, uh, you know, processes uh, uh, that respect uh, people who work for them, the customers and all that people that involve that. So in that case, obviously we have done a lot of training uh, and mentorship uh, for the SMEs uh, because we realized that it's sometimes not the understanding uh, of what the process is about. Um, um, and of course, sometimes those issues that are human rights related are ignored by them. Uh, not in, uh, from our perspective, it's not that they, they do it intentionally, but sometimes we just concentrate the what they are doing and uh, not realizing that, you know, some of the work they are doing are actually infringing the human rights of so many people, especially either customers or the public in general, or the people they are doing, uh, they're working with. So you find people like, um, you find a startup, you know, developing a, a system that collects uh, data from the public and, you know, they don't take into account the privacy of this data and whether people are consented when they use that data in any way. Uh, to them, it's just innovation, innovation, that is the, um, the, 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 uh, the talk. We have to innovate, we have to, you know, disrupt the space, we have to do that. So we find that talk of disrupting and innovation, but in the process, uh, the human rights is never a core in their design. It's never, you know, um, in front um, uh, when they're starting or when they're designing their system. Sometimes you get a system that, you know, the disabled members of the community cannot use, um, but, you know, to them it is, yeah, we are innovating. So uh, that to us um, doing the mentorship, has changed a lot and a lot of training has changed that and, um, and, and that has made us to move forward. Um, I needed to have started by introducing Beck. Beck is a blog association of Kenya, uh, which of course, what we do is to represent the interest of content creators in Kenya, as well as look at the digital rights of the public. So our main work, especially on this is uh, looking at the digital rights of, the, uh, of Kenyans and in, in Africa in general, and we have done a lot of this, uh, in, um, some of this program to um, move forward with that. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Apologies again for um, the mistake earlier. Um, great summary. Actually, there is a member of the audience here who would like to speak. Uh, Amir, um, you have requested uh, to... Hi. Hello, can you hear me, Will? Yeah, could you introduce yourself and... Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, hello to everyone and hello to distinguished panelists. Uh, I'm Amir Mukaberi from Iranian Academic Community. I, I would like to share uh, and another issue regarding human rights and internet. Uh, I would like uh, to thank you uh, for convening this uh, time this session. Uh, I would like to raise a vital issue regarding human rights in digital space. Uh, uh, my, I would like to talk about uh, UCM in cyber war. Uh, uh, unilateral coercive measure in cyber world, and I think this is uh, highly related to topic of your valuable session. As you all know, more than three countries are not suffering from this issue, from the issue of and negative effect of unilateral digital sanctions in digital space. As you know all, the negative effect of unilateral digital sanctions on some nations could have become intensive and more destructive, especially during COVID-19 pandemic and other emergencies. 
Uh, these digital sanctions are on many area, like on investment in ICT infrastructures, digital services, licenses, uh, digital resources like IPs and DNS system and access to network are key barrier and obstacle in achieving national development goals using ICTs. Uh, I believe these uh, digital restrictive measures constitute human rights violation in cyberspace, especially violation of right to development, right of people to education, right to businesses, and so on. Uh, some of our universities in Iran have problem to access to some scientific database and some Iranian digital businesses and application of some Iranian uh, entrepreneurs have been removed from digital stores like uh, from Google Play and Apple Store with pretext of sanctions of their respective government. Okay. My suggestion is non-discriminatory non in access to ICTs and cyber capacity building for all nations should be a new norm for having inclusive internet. I would like to request uh, uh, my colleagues and dear panelists and dear audience that this common concern will be reflected in final outcome of this session and final outcome of IGF 2021 in Poland. And also I would like to request uh, my, uh, my colleagues that reflect uh, in their works of United Nations uh, guiding principle on business and un, uh, human rights this uh, concern. My question is that what would be the role of what would be the role and contribution of UN family and IGF plus community to address this vital issue? Many thanks for the opportunity uh, to share uh, our views with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Amir. I think um, I think you raised a very very interesting point. I mean, uh, it, it, looking at the technology users as digital citizens, not you know necessarily from a nationalist um, perspective, um, but I mean, if you are a digital entity, you don't actually have a national identity per se, and you can kind of somewhat you know. Uh, travel all over the world and then you know when you are restricted in the case of sanctions uh, then what do you do uh, did I get you correct Amir okay never mind uh, Amir I think um, uh, I'm not sure I, I would actually open up uh, the opportunity maybe to to my uh, colleagues here who may want to um, answer or may want to comment on Amir's point uh, otherwise Amir um, um, maybe you could uh, share with us your contact details so that anyone who is interested in this can 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 uh, can reach out to you. Thank you very much because yeah. this issue could be the issue of many parties and many countries. Uh, for example, yeah. more than three countries now is suffering from this issue, right. and at yeah. the global level, we should mm -hmm. think about this issue. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, if if um, I mean, if if you can't, I'm sorry if you can't get the answer here from this session in particular because we are here, uh, pretty much focused on the UNGP for Business and Human Rights. But if there's anyone interested to to talk to Amir further on on this particular thing that he's raised up, maybe uh, Amir, you can share your contact details and um, you guys can take it from there. Um. Do we have so thank any... you for your kind consideration. Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Amir, and thank you for participating. And uh, we actually have six more minutes, uh, six minutes left to the session. So we do still have time for a couple more uh, questions. As I said earlier, I do I did have some questions for, for Barbara and actually one for Alia. Uh, but I would like to give the opportunity for the audience to, to interact with the speakers. Do we have anyone on Q and A? No. Okay. Um, actually, Barbara, my question to you uh, on your presentation about the uh, engagement with the national ISPs. Um, oh, sorry. I've just been informed that we actually have ten minutes. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So, 
I'll, I'll start first, uh, Barbara. Um, actually, uh, when you say there was resistance from the from the ISPs, actually, uh, I'm curious, what did they actually say when 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 they resist? So, <laughs> so how did how did they say that they you know they're, they're probably reluctant uh, to adopt uh, the UNGPs uh, into their business practices? Um, can I respond? All right. Okay, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, yes. yeah they, yes. they say to us um, mostly that these are not mandatory practices by law in Brazil, uh, right. especially those that aren't um, mandatory in our data protection law and other laws that tackle data protection issues. And they resist saying it's um, secondly difficult for them to adapt for these changes to publish transparency, full transparency reports, data protection impact assessments, and to notify users in cases of data requests by law enforcement agents. So they, they claim mainly these two arguments that they, these are not things that are mandatory by law and technical difficulties to adopt. Yeah, um, okay. Um pretty much expected, I guess, from, from uh, businesses and companies. Um, the law thing is pretty easy. Actually, the, the technical um, answer is, um, is very easy to say you can create anything essentially. So why not create more code, right? <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much, Baba, for answering the question. Um, I have one question for Alia, actually, um, because uh, the, the, the presentation by Alia was uh, on um, uh, this particular issue of uh, private lending uh, becoming a problem uh, and creating social problems in Indonesia. Uh, my question is that uh, you know, uh, is there any other? Uh, what are the other issues that are also raised uh, in Indonesia with regards to the practices, like the business practices of tech companies in Indonesia in particular? Um, uh, yeah, like uh, apart apart from the uh, uh, apart from the pinjo, apart from the private lending. There are many actually, but maybe one uh, major instance uh, is the internet shutdowns. I think this is closely related with uh, um, Amir's points uh, that was raised earlier about how um, digital uh, inequality in uh, access to uh, digital uh, online spaces has been really um, severely affecting people during this pandemic, COVID-19. And Indonesia, I think, is one of the, um, in Southeast Asia region, I think, um, is implementing uh, internet shutdowns during politically sensitive time in Indonesia, particularly during um, demonstrations in certain regions, for example, in Papua, um, that has been um, uh, struggling for uh, their self-determination rights uh, um, from Indonesia. And um, we, we've seen that there, there is also a separate lawsuit uh, challenging the governments on the internet shutdowns on that area. And uh, where is the tech companies role in this uh, whole scenario is because the internet shutdown is uh, imposed by the internet service provider. So, um, this ISP is very much uh, involved in this um, violations to freedom of expressions, particularly rights to access information in online spaces during these very critical times, because we know that people are turning to social media to seek for information around how to self isolation, for example, how to access hospitals. That has that still has rooms for people that have COVID, as well as to access telemedicine uh, 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 services, for example. Because uh, um, in Indonesia, I think during the early uh, 2021, um, we've seen uh, our health system is is nearly collapsing uh, because of COVID, and telemedicine services has been a life saving uh, uh, um, uh, services that has been really useful for people. And some people, unfortunately, aren't really uh, accessing that because the governments are not giving them internet access. And this is also a major 
uh, uh, problems in Indonesia and ISP is involved uh, in this uh, uh, particular instance of violations of digital rights. I think that's um, from me, Mariam. I hope that answers. Apart from that, we have a lot of problems about content moderations and criminalizations over legitimate expressions, but I'll stop here and give back the floor to you. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, the, the the examples that you just mentioned are, are definitely the more traditional, uh, like not traditional, like those are the ones that we've heard of like a lot. Uh, this pinjol thing uh, or this, um, online um, lending uh, problem um, probably is under you know more under researched than more than the others um, but one thing is very clear is that all these social problems they have already existed like these are problems that have always been there and what the digital uh, transformation so to speak does is that they amplify these problems even more and uh, and we saw that you know with with with, with the COVID and 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 then everyone having to switch to the online world and then we start seeing all the, the like literally it's like all these social problems that we've been ignoring for so many years they just get amplified and then just into our faces. So um, thank you. I'm I'm pretty sure uh, uh, other countries also experience similar problems. I would like to open the floor once again before we close this room in three minutes uh, to anyone who may have uh, some comments or feedback or any of uh, my colleagues here who would like to chime in and add a little bit more. Eduardo, maybe since you were the first, <laughs> you you may have something to add. Uh, no, yes, I mean, um, considering particularly the, the, the situation in Argentina, I mean, one thing that concerns me the most here is that many of the companies operating in my country uh, doesn't have their headquarters in, in my country, and they don't have even a branch here, you know, so for instance, very, most of the surveillance technologies that is applied in Argentina is, is manufactured and, and sell by private company outside the country, you know, so that, that's a problem for, for us because uh, maybe, maybe you could have a national action plan, but if companies are not uh, uh, present here, um, I mean, it's, it's very difficult in, in, to enforce that, you know, so I mean, while it's important to have a national action plan, I mean, it's important also to to, to work jointly the, the state, the, the, the civil society, civil society organization in, at the international level, no? So I think this is a global effort, not only a national one. Yeah, I mean, as for Malaysians, we have always been so jealous of Indonesia because all the big tech companies are <laughs> headquartered in Jakarta. And I'm like, why do they not come here? I'm like, great, great point, excellent point, Eduardo. Um, uh, we have only two minutes left, so maybe I would like to just go around the the, the panel um, before I go into summary and start closing the uh, session. Um, Eduardo, you've spoken. Gabriel, anything to add before we close? Okay, uh, just to add to what Eduardo said regarding having. Uh, tech companies who are not residents in your country producing uh, tools to use. I think again, what the national action, so the national action plan actually gives power to the governments to protect the people. I think in producing national action plans for different countries, uh, there should be consideration for, com for for countries to be specific in terms of when when applications are being used in your countries, how are this um, how is this data being used? You need to keep an eye on it because that's the only way you can actually protect the rights of the people that you govern in your country. So in in uh, it's it, it, like, just to say to that that yes, we can have national action plan for the country, but again, it should give power to the uh, not power in code like power not abusive power, but again, power to actually protect the people from them being abused by companies who are not residents in your country you know if you have a country company against your country you cannot easily go after them but if they are if they are foreign companies and you don't have access to them it could be a very big issue so that's why the country also needs to actually keep their feet when engaging with these companies before coming into your country think ahead and ask yourself that okay let us think 30 years to come what can actually change and how can we engage with these people to ensure that we have rights respecting rules that we are creating for our citizens Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Gabriel. Let's go to Kennedy. Yes, uh, thank you very much again, Maria. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add that um, uh, one of the things that uh, helped uh, Kenya move forward a little bit is uh, the, uh, the enactment of uh, Data Protection Act. Um, and with that, um, a lot of some of the issues of the, um, the companies which are not operating in the country or operating in the country and they don't have their headquarters, uh, the law has you know, uh, sort of you know, brought in them uh, to, to regulate some of the things they're doing within the country. So um, when, we came, when the country came up with the Data Protection Act um, and made it a law, uh, that has really improved a lot of things for the uh, the human rights, um, especially protection protection of the uh, private data and uh, the privacy of individuals. Uh, it was uh, mostly based on the uh, on the Europe uh, model. Um, so yeah, but but it really has helped um, that. Though we still don't have the the, the final version of the NAP and uh, the National Action Plan. And the Data Protection Act has really helped, especially in the tech sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, I don't know if Catherine, would you like to add something last minute? No? Yes? OK. OK, got it. All right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in this session. And thank you to the speakers, as well as the audience and the audience who have uh, interacted and engaged and listened to us. Um, in the chat, there is a link to, to, for you to contact all the speakers who have been on this uh, panel today. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, we, are, we wish you a very happy, happy holidays and Merry Christmas and uh, may the next year be a lot, lot, lot better than, than the last two years. So thank you so much, everyone. See you again. And yes, happy Human Rights Day.